right, praise the Lord. Okay, a lot of people wearing red and white. Praise God. Happy uh, Canada Day, everyone. Again, just uh, shake hands with those around you. Greet them. Happy Canada Day. Praise the Lord. I thank the Lord for the uh, privilege that uh, we can study again God's Word with you this afternoon. You may not be aware of it, but today is the last day the last Sunday, I mean, of June, that means we are now halfway through 2024. Six months ago, we were greeting each other, Happy New Year. So after six months, how are you doing? Are you still happy? Now it's not wrong to desire happiness. I mean, nobody wants to be sad. But the problem is, many people think that because it's enshrined in the U.S. Declaration of Independence, that one of our NL, how do you pronounce that? NL, oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. One of the rights that we have is the pursuit of happiness right there. All right? The pursuit of happiness. And so many people think, that life is all about pursuing happiness. In fact, every year, they come up with this global happiness index, supposedly identifying the happiest countries in the world. And those are the six uh, factors that they consider. And in this year, 2024, out of the 149 countries, the 10 happiest countries in the world, number 10 is Australia, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Norway, Netherlands, Israel is number 5, Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, and Finland has always been number 1 for several years. You might be wondering why, where is Canada? Well, we have been part of the top 10 in 2019. We begin to slide down. And so this year, we are now number 15. But the U.S. is number 23. And of course, the Philippines is number 53. And the last country, now 149th. The last in the list is Afghanistan. And so many people today have made it their single-minded focus to find happiness. But friends, unfortunately, to their own destruction, many of the things that people think that would make them happy are actually detrimental physically, damaging emotionally, and defiling spiritually. But what the Word of God, in fact, tells us is not to pursue happiness. Happiness is just the byproduct. What the Bible tells us is that we need to pursue relationship. The horizontal relationship with people and the vertical relationship with God. So here in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with everyone. So that means we are to pursue harmony with everyone. Now I know some of you are asking right now, well, Pastor Roy, how about if the other person doesn't want peace? I already extended my hand and he doesn't want to shake my hands. What can, what can we do? Well, don't worry, the Bible covers that as well. In Romans chapter 12, verse 18, it says, if it is possible. Because sometimes it's not possible. There are people, they don't want peace. They don't want to resolve the issues. But as far as it depends on you, that means you have exhausted all the possibilities to be reconciled with this person. But still, you know, he or she doesn't want it. 
then your hands are clean before the Lord, your conscience uh, is clean before God, and then it says there, live at peace with everyone. Now, that bothers some people. Everyone, including your mother-in-law, that's included in the everyone. And the Bible also makes it clear that one of the hindrance to living a harmonious life is pride. So in verse 16, it says, Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. So first of all is the horizontal relationship. We are to pursue harmony. And then it says here, continuing with that verse, and to be holy. That means we are to pursue holiness in terms of our relationship with God. And then look at the warning. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. That means it's not enough to confess with your mouth that you're a Christian. It has to be, there should be a fruit that can be seen by people and so that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. And so clearly, what the Word of God is telling us is that God is more interested in our holiness than in our happiness. And so it's all about relationships, harmony in our relationship with people, holiness in our relationship with God, and that is what will produce true happiness. When Jesus Christ was asked, which is the greatest commandment? The Lord Jesus Christ said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the vertical relationship. And then he said the second is love your neighbor as yourself. The horizontal relationship. And so friends, the pursuit of happiness is not what the Bible prescribes. Happiness is only the outcome of it. We are to pursue loving relationships with God and with people. And so one major function of the Bible is to expose the lies of Satan who operates through deception to keep people from discovering what life really is all about and where happiness can truly be found. And basically, what Satan is telling people today, you will be happy if you, do, if you pursue these things. If you pursue fortune and power, and if you pursue fame and pleasure, that's the lie of the enemy. And many people who have pursued this fortune and power, fame and pleasure, found themselves shipwrecked. Even Christians have destroyed their faith in the process. So friends, the question is, what is it that will truly make us happy? If you are to complete this sentence, you know, you don't have to announce it, just in your heart and in your mind, complete that sentence. I would be happy if only I have what? I would be happy if only I have what? For some people, I would be happy if only I have bigger income. I would be happy if I have a better house. I will be happy if I have a boyfriend. I will be happy if I, I have a baby. I will be happy if I have a romantic husband. I mean... Judy doesn't have to wish that. <laughs> but actually, that's her number one prayer. <laughs> if only, if only, if only. Again, friends, there's nothing wrong if we desire these things. It's nothing wrong if you want a bigger house or a bigger salary. There's nothing wrong with your desire to have a baby or to have a boyfriend. The problem happens... When that desire becomes the demand. When we begin to demand as if God owes us, and if God doesn't do it, then life is incomplete and God is unfair. 
when the desire becomes the demand. That's what makes it wrong. But that question is very important. What is it that will truly make you happy? So this afternoon, I'd like for us to listen to the Apostle Paul. What he says makes him happy. His greatest source of joy, his purpose of living, what he seeks in life. So I have entitled this message to rejoice is a choice. And we're looking at Philippians chapter 1, 12 to 26. And the theme is this question, what is our greatest source of joy? Come on, think about it. What is your greatest source of joy? Friends, our answer to this question will directly influence our response to any given situation. May it be in our personal life or in our love life or in our ministry or professional life. And so this passage that we're going to study this afternoon will show us the Apostle Paul's answer to this very question. And so here we'll find out what makes him tick. His purpose in life, his priorities, philosophy in life. And my prayer is that God will remind us of our ultimate calling, our purpose for living, and that philosophy of life that we need to subscribe to. So that's my prayer. Let's bow our heads and let's commit this time to the Lord. Father God, we live in a time when so many people are so unhappy. They're looking for happiness in the wrong places. And Lord, our prayer this afternoon is that you would open our eyes and our minds, soften our hearts, so that we will receive your word gladly. And Lord, our prayer this afternoon is that each one of us will sense that conviction from your spirit, that settled persuasion that will help change our mindset, change our paradigm as to what life really is all about. That it's not about the pursuit of happiness, but that loving relationship with you and loving relationship with people. And so this is our prayer, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. You know, this letter of the Apostle Paul to the Philippians is considered to be the happiest letter he ever wrote. I mean, if you look at one translation, the word rejoice appears nine times in this letter, nine times. The word joy and rejoice in the Greek appears 16 times. In the original. And yet the Apostle Paul, when he wrote this letter, actually was in prison in Rome. And didn't know whether he would live or die. And when the Philippians heard of his imprisonment, they became very concerned. You know, they know what it means for Paul to be in prison. Because the church in Philippi got started with a prison ministry. Remember the Philippian jailer. And Lydia, they're in Greece. And so they sent Epaphroditus to care for him. Epaphroditus brought with him a generous gift from the Philippian church. And the money he used to be able to rent his own place while waiting for his case to be heard. He was under house arrest instead of staying in a dungeon. Now, it's been quite some time since Epaphroditus left and the Philippian church haven't heard any feedback yet. And so they were quite anxious to know what had happened to the ministry of Paul now that he's in prison. He's under house arrest. They supposed that his confinement had hindered the spread of the gospel. They thought that Paul must be lonely. He must be depressed, being chained to a Roman guard 24 hours a day. I mean... It's just understandable for Paul to be unhappy, considering. I mean, he has already committed his life to God, and I mean, this is the thanks he got. 
anyone would under such depressing circumstance would be unhappy. So they were waiting for some news, and then lo and behold, here comes Epaphroditus bearing a letter from their beloved apostle. At last, their doubts and questions will be answered. So how is the apostle Paul doing? Here's the first point that we read here, is that Paul is joyful even though in chains. We read this in verse 12. It says there, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served the advance of the gospel. The Philippians thought that his imprisonment was a terrible thing. But Paul here is emphasizing that that's just not the case. It's in fact the opposite. Something good came out of it. You know, when we are in a tight situation, when we're struggling, usually our focus is on the negative, the dark side of it. And we begin to complain and we grumble and we even blame God for allowing this unfortunate circumstance to fall upon us. Especially those of us who are serving God. You know, you're serving as part of the worship team. You give up your time to do the practices on Wednesday night. And you're just asking God for a break that you can get a job. And still you don't have a job. Here am I asking God for protection as I travel to different countries. And then the doctor telling me that I have stage 4 cancer. It's not easy because we think that if we're serving God, it's tit for tat, then he should give us whatever we want. Well, friends, let me remind you that God is not a genie in Aladdin's lamp that if you just rub it with your hands and rub his pleasure, then you have three wishes. That's not the God of the Bible. So how do we respond when things are not happening your way? The different situations we find ourselves in, the daily occurrences. As we all know, friends, circumstances can rob us of our joy. Isn't that true? I mean, for most of us, if our circumstances are good, then we're happy. If job is pleasant, if bills are being paid, if we get to buy the things we want, if we can have a vacation at least once a year, then most of us are pretty happy. But when circumstances go bad, many times we go to pieces. Circumstances can rob us of our joy, but not the Apostle Paul. He chooses to rejoice in his circumstance. He chooses to focus on the bright side of things, the blessing in disguise. He said, my confinement has really served to advance, look at that word, advance the gospel. Now the word advance is quite a vivid word in the Greek. It's actually a military word which refers to a group of woodcutters who would go ahead of an army to clear the way. And so these woodcutters, they would cut through the forest, prepare a road, build a bridge so that the advancing army can pass through unhindered. And so Paul said, my imprisonment has actually cleared the way for the gospel to advance to new territories. And what's this new territory that he's referring to? Verse 13, he said, as a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. This new territory was the PSG, the Presidential Security Group, the Emperor's Praetorian Guard. You see, Paul was under house arrest while waiting for his trial, but even though he lives in his own rented apartment, he was still a prisoner of Rome. And Roman law would have him chained to the wrist of a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. Now, there was a changing of the guard every six hours. And so Paul would have four different soldiers chained to him throughout the day. So how would you like to be under house arrest, 
chained to a Roman soldier permanently. When you go to sleep, you're chained to this guard. When you eat, you're chained to this guard. When you take your shower, you're chained to this guard. When you go to the toilet, poor guard. I mean, the whole time, chained to a Roman guard. That's depressing, isn't it? A man who claimed to speak more than, uh, who's, who claimed to speak in tongues more than the Corinthians. And all these guards, every six hours, they would hear Paul praying and singing. And the Apostle Paul, looking at this from a positive point of view, from the point of view of the Roman government, Paul was a captive chained to a Roman guard. But from Paul's point of view, the Roman guards were captives chained to him. So whether they like it or not, they have to listen to him for six hours. I mean, man, if you can't explain the gospel in six hours, you don't know anything. So what has happened here is that first of all, his captors were evangelized. He turned his prison cell into a, an evangelistic office. His chains became an effective line of communication. His captors were his captive audience. There is a clear indication in this letter that Paul was converting soldier after soldier after soldier. How many soldiers got converted? We do not know. If he had four soldiers a day, and we'll assume that it's a different soldier every time. Now, Paul was under house arrest for two years. So try to think about that. Four soldiers times 365 days in one year times two years. That means he had the chance to present the gospel 2,920 times. Again, that's assuming it's a different soldier every time. Maybe not. But whatever it is, there were enough conversions for the Apostle Paul to say here in Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, all the saints send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. Wow! This new territory, the advance of the gospel, the gospel penetrated the imperial barracks until it reached those who were working in Caesar's household. The cooks, the housemaids, the gardeners, those who were keeping the animals. The gospel has advanced to this new territory. Friends, I don't know what your circumstances are. I do not know what your job situation is, what your health condition is. But whatever it is, it carries with it opportunities to share the gospel. You see, sometimes God has to put us in chains so that we'll accomplish something which would not be possible under normal circumstances. When my urologist told me January last year that I have prostate cancer, and that it has already metastasized to the pelvic area, the pelvic bones. He said, Roy, this is already incurable. And then he said, but if you go through chemo or radiation, maybe your life can be extended two or three more years. Now, when I heard these words, immediately I sense that he's a man committed to science. He doesn't know God. He doesn't know the God of the supernatural. I mean, doctors, they want to help. But if they don't believe in God, they don't have the last words. Only God has the last words. And so when I talk to my oncologist, if I go through chemo, this was last year, 
what will happen? And he said, well, you'll be, you'll have to stay here in Canada for at least six months. You can no longer travel and do your ministry. And after six months of treatment, we still do not know what, how your body will take it. Because, you know, chemo is a double-edged sword. It kills both the good and the bad cells. And you know what? January last year, God reminded me of my lifetime verse, Acts 20, 24. And it says there, For I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only goal is to finish the race and complete the task the Lord Jesus Christ has given me. And so I said to my oncologist, I will not go through chemo. My year is already set up. I'm going to travel to Greece and Turkey. I'm going to the Middle East. I'm going to the Philippines. I'm going to Europe. If God still has a plan for me, he can extend my life. That's nothing to God. Two to three years, that's nothing to God. But if my life, if there's no more purpose for my life, God can take me. There's nothing I can do with that as well. In fact, I'm more excited that finally I will see the Lord Jesus Christ eye to eye. And so that's the kind of mindset. And so sometimes God has to put us into those chains so that it, became, it becomes a testimony. And I'm just waiting for that day. Last month, they checked up again. They had my CT scan. And to check if the cancer has spread to the other organs. And the CT scan showed that it has not spread. And then I had my bone scan because... You know, it has already went into the bones in the pelvic area. And the CT scan revealed that the cancer has already shrunk. I'm just waiting for my oncologist to say, you're cancer free. And then to testify of God's goodness. You said it's incurable, but I know of a God with whom nothing is incurable. Again, I have nothing against chemo. Those who would like to go through chemo or radiation, God can still use those ways to cure you. But God somehow has just given me enough faith to trust him that this is how it should be. Chains can come in different forms. Like there are mothers who may feel like they're chained to their home and caring for their children. You know, our, our kids, our babies, they demand so much of our time and our effort. But friends, don't think of those times as waste, wasted times when you have to spend so much time for your babies and your children. God can use those chains to reach people with the message of salvation. I mean, consider, in the early 1700s, there was a mother named Susanna Wesley. She was the mother of 19 children, 19, one nine. Now remember, this was before disposable diapers. This was before powdered milk. 19 children, that's a full-time job. But out of that large family came John Wesley and Charles Wesley, whose combined ministry shook the British Isles. You may be chained taking care of your children, but remember the time that you've invested to the child could shake this nation. This could be the next evangelist. This could be the next Billy Graham. Never think that it's a waste of time. Whatever you are chained to, just lead the way that renders the gospel believable and let God do the rest. He has placed you in that job. He has placed you in that situation for a purpose. So you can be joyful even though in chains. But not only were the captors evangelized, the colleagues of Paul in Rome were emboldened. And that's what we read in verse 14. Verse 14 says, 
because of my chains, most of the brothers in the Lord have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. So Paul's imprisonment also had an impact within the church in Rome. The implication of this verse 14 is that before Paul's imprisonment, the church in Rome lacked courage. They were timid. But now because of Paul's witness, many of the brothers were emboldened by his courage. Out of Paul's suffering were born valiant and courageous preachers who would not otherwise have opened their mouths to preach the gospel. You know, it's true that whenever Christianity goes through a crisis, it brings about courageous Christians. And that's why the fastest growing churches right now are in China and in Iran. They're flourishing better than the churches in many democratic countries. Of course, one reason for this is that in difficult situations, the, the reality of a transformed life is more apparent. It's more clearly attractive. So we really have to, we really have a greater opportunity to shine for Jesus when things are at its worst, when we are in chains. How is the Apostle Paul doing? Secondly, the Apostle Paul is joyful in spite of critics. In spite of critics. You know, for some people, it is the circumstance that can rob them of their joy. But for others, it's people who can rob them of their joy. You know that guy that you have to work with in your office? The moment you see him in the morning when you go to your office, you lose your sanctification. Immediately, your blood just boils just looking at this person. People can cause us to lose our, our joy, especially with people who have been given the gift of criticism. You know those people in the church, they have the gift of criticism. They make it their business to find out what they can criticize with you. You know, it's like the saying, to dwell above with saints we love, oh, that will indeed be glory. But to live below with saints we know, well, that's another story. And here the Apostle Paul has to live with all these critics. As if his imprisonment is not enough, Paul had detractors who preached the gospel, but their purpose in doing so is to discredit him, to accuse him, to criticize him, to dishonor Paul. And why would they do this? Well, first of all, they did it because they were jealous. Because of jealousy. And that's what we read in verses 15 and 16. It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so in love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. You see, Paul's critics were jealous of his giftedness and his successes. And so they're trying to put him down. They're trying to drum up some false accusations. And it's not difficult to imagine what they were trying to imply about the imprisonment of Paul. Some of them are saying, I think he's being disciplined by God. That's why he's in prison. You know those innuendos? You know, I think the reason why he's in prison, it's because there's a secret sin in the life of Paul. You know, there's some people who are like that. Some people who can only feel good about themselves if they make others look bad. Unfortunately, there are Christians like that. The only time they will smell good is when they let the, the bad smell of the others come out. Jealousy. And they criticize. And they gossip. And if you try to correct them, Pastor, it's not gossiping. I'm just sharing a prayer request. 
Some people are saying, you know why Paul is in prison? I think God is punishing him. And then the others would say, you know why he's in prison? Because he lacked God's power. You know, the reason Paul is in prison is that he hasn't learned to tap on the resources of God's power like we have. Maybe it's Paul, his faith is not strong enough. That's why he's in prison. But friends, related to jealousy is also because they were ambitious. They were ambitious. Verse 17 says, the former preached Christ out of selfish ambition. Not sincerely supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. So, so to these critics, you know, Paul is blocking the spotlight. And so they try to stir up trouble so that they can displace Paul out of his seat of authority. He's always on the stage, so we need to remove him out of the stage so we can replace him. And some of them are saying, you know, the Lord put Paul in prison and left us free because Paul is old time. And we're the replacements. It's time for fresh blood in the ministry. See, they were jealous. They were ambitious. They preached the right message, but their motives were wrong. They just wanted to hurt Paul so they could be on the top. And what was Paul's response to all of this? Did he allow these people to rob him of his joy? Look at verse 18. Verse 18, here's what he said. Incredible. But what does it matter to me? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Can you imagine this guy? He has a different take on things. He looks at the, the bright side of it. A good paraphrase of verse 18 by Chuck Swindoll says, So what if some preach with, with wrong motives? So what if some are overly interested in themselves? So what if, they are, if there are some who take unfair shots at me? What matters most is this. Christ is being preached and that thought alone intensifies my joy. Wow. To rejoice is a choice. It's how you look at things. Are you going to focus on the dark side of the moon or on the bright side? And so for Paul, what makes him really happy, as long as Christ is exalted and the gospel is ex extended, no amount of chains and criticism will rob him of his joy. Next, we see here that Paul is joyful regardless of crisis. Regardless of crisis. Now the second half of verse 18 up to verse 19, here's what it says. Yes, I will continue to rejoice. And then verse 19, for I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. You know, we cannot help but notice the confidence in those words when he said, for I know, he said. You know, it's a subtle persuasion. He was confident that his present trials would turn out for his future deliverance. And there are two things here that we can see that made him confident. Number one, what made him confident is because of the prayers of the saints. The prayers of the saints. He knew people are praying for him. Praying for his release. You know, when I announced my medical problem, and people started praying in the Middle East, in the Philippines, in Europe, here in Canada, I ha it, it, it gave me a boost of confidence. I know God will do what is right because people are praying. You get that dose of confidence in whatever situation you may be in if you know there are Christians who are praying for you. That's why we encourage each one of you to become part of a life group. In a life group, you can pray for one another. You get to know people. 
I know some people, they want to come to church. They want a big church where they can just appear and disappear and nobody's looking for them. No accountability. But friends, in this church, we want you to be part of a small group where you can be accountable, where people are actually caring for you and asking about you. Where is so-and-so? Why is he not here today? And they're praying for you. And of course, we encourage you to attend our prayer meeting on Wednesday nights. It's so different when you know people are interceding. And that gives us a boost of confidence. Not only that, he said that he was confident in the provision of the Spirit. That's what it says there in verse 19. It says, For I know that through your prayers and the help given by the Spirit, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. The word help in the original means bountiful provision. The Apostle Paul was speaking of the resources of the Spirit in times of need. When we're desperately in need, we can be sure that the Holy Spirit grants us everything necessary to sustain us through that ordeal. God will supply every need so that we can go through that ordeal. I do not know what you're going through these days. Maybe you're in the middle of a war zone in terms of your relationships. Maybe parents against children. Maybe husbands and wives. Maybe you and your in-laws. Maybe your office mates. Maybe with your boss. Maybe there's this problem. But friends, if you have people praying for you and the Spirit of God is supplying all your needs, you can choose to remain joyful. And that's why Paul could declare here in verse 20, he said, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. You know, that's all he wanted. That Christ will be exalted, whether by life or by death. In another translation, instead of the word exalted, it uses the word magnified in my body. Whether by life or by death. You know, he doesn't really care if he will live or die as long as he can magnify Christ in the process. And that's what makes him tick. That means, friends, he remained joyful even though in chains as long as the gospel is extended. He remained joyful in spite of critics as long as Christ is preached. He remained joyful regardless of the life and death crisis as long as Christ is magnified. Brothers and sisters, nothing will rob us of our joy for as long as we make Christ the central focus of our lives. Extend the gospel. Exalt the Lord. And whether by life or by death, we are to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ. There was a church in New Jersey. A young man was baptized and later on got married to a dedicated Christian woman. And together this young couple, John and Betty Stam, went as missionaries to China where they served Christ in such a way that the whole countryside knew about them. Then came the momentous day, December 8, 1934, when these two young missionaries were caught by bandits and cruelly murdered. The manner in which they died did more for the gospel work in that area than the years of missionary endeavor. But the last letter that this young missionary wrote Included were these words. They said, God knows what our end is, but we have decided that by life or death, he shall be magnified. Now friends, on the physical level, how do you magnify something? You can magnify something either by using a microscope or a telescope. You see, what a microscope does is that it will take something little and make it large. That's how you magnify. 
But on the other end, this telescope takes something that is far off and then brings it near. And you know, that's exactly what we are to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is not little, I don't mean that. But to this world, he's little. And you know what a Christian does to magnify the Lord Jesus Christ? A Christian takes Jesus that this world thinks is little and make him large. And also, Jesus is not far away. But to this old, simple world, they think that Jesus Christ is far off. But Christians who magnify Jesus will bring him near. As long as Jesus is exalted, whenever the gospel is extended, this is what gives, this is what gives the Apostle Paul the greatest joy. Now, the last six verses... And the last point in our outline, Paul is joyful because of Christ. Paul is joyful because of Christ. Here in verse 21, we find Paul's philosophy of life. It's easy to memorize. I'd like for us to memorize it this afternoon. One of the shortest verses in the Bible, Philippians 121. Philippians 1.21, all together, let's read this. All together, ready? Read. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You know, the truth of this verse becomes evident when we read these altered versions. Look at these altered versions. Instead of, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain, People are saying, for to me to leave is money, and to die is to leave it all behind. For others, for to me to leave is fame, and to die is to be forgotten. For others, for to me to leave is power, and to die is to lose it all. And still for others, for to me to leave is possessions, and to die is to take none of them with me. Friends, let's make this as our philosophy in life. Philippians 1.21 Repeat it with me now with no words there. Ready? Say it. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Philippians 1.21 Brothers and sisters, what are you living for? The answer to this question will directly influence the way you will respond to life's opportunities and difficulties. Also, the answer to this question will determine your response not only to life but also to death. And for the Apostle Paul, because for him to live is Christ and to die is gain, he said his desire was to depart and to be with the Savior. I mean, look at the tug of war that's happening in the mind of Paul here in verse 22 and 23. He said, if I'm going on living, if I am going on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet, what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. That's the best option. If after this trial, I'll be beheaded, praise the Lord. He's not afraid of dying because he's been living for Christ. And to die is gain. In Paul's mind, the gain of dying, that he would instantly be with Christ. And so, when I heard those words, when the doctor said, this is now incurable. I was excited, actually. I mean, my wife was there, seated beside me in the clinic of the doctor, and he said, this is now incurable. You, you know, it has metastasized, and it's now stage four cancer. I was excited. I, I, I mean, Judy was in tears. I mean, she couldn't find another handsome man again, so I can understand that. No kidding aside, if you know that you know that you know that you're a Christian, death is not a problem. 
And that's why Paul said, where is your sting, O death? Lo death has lost its sting. You're no longer afraid now. Because you know that you are in God's hands and that God will do what is right. But then, look at his decision. Paul said his decision was to remain and be with the saints. His desire was to depart and be with the Savior, but his decision was to remain and be with the saints. Verses 24 and 20 to 26. 24, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your joy in Christ Jesus will overflow on account of me. So by staying, Paul knew that he could continue nurturing the Philippians' growth and maturity in the Lord. Now that's incredible, isn't it? He was willing to sacrifice his desire to be with the Lord just so that he can help others. So unselfish, isn't it? He's not in it for the money. He just want to help. He is willing to postpone going to heaven in order to help Christians grow. He just wanted more and more people to hear the good news. That's what he lived for. He lived for the gospel. He lived for Christ, brothers and sisters. If our goal in life is to become more like Jesus Christ, every circumstance will be of advantage to us. So whether you're chained up or criticized or in a life or death crisis, it's an advantage. You've got nothing to lose and everything to gain. Do you realize, friends, that the day you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, God made a promise. God promised that he's going to predestine you that someday you will become like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that purpose is going to be accomplished. No circumstance in life can hinder God from making you into the likeness of His Son. Everything that is happening to you right now, all the disappointments, all the hardships, all of this is part of the process so you can become like the Lord Jesus Christ. He's doing that with you now. He's doing that with me now. With this cancer that God in his own will will take away so I can continue to live. I heard about a sculptor who was working on a big chunk of marble and he was just chipping away. And this woman passing by asked the sculptor, what are you working on? And the sculptor said, I'm making a statue of a horse. And the woman stood back and said, I don't see a horse. And the sculptor said, that's right. It's because I'm not finished yet. But I'm chipping away anything that doesn't look like a horse. And when I'm done, you won't have any problem recognizing it. And you see, God is going to make you and me just like the Lord Jesus Christ. He is chipping away anything that doesn't look like the Lord Jesus Christ. He's chipping away that dirty, rotten attitude that you have. He's chipping away that sin. He's chipping away that laziness. He's chipping away that addiction. And you say, oh, Pastor Roy, I'm so far from that. I don't look like Jesus Christ right now. Yeah, I know. You look more like a horse. But that's okay. You see, God is not finished with us yet. But God is chipping away. He's removing this part of your life, that attitude, anything that's ugly, that doesn't look like the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, praise God. God is faithful and is going to bring it to completion. And the Apostle Paul, with confidence, he said these words. I'd like for all of us to read this together and we're almost done. All together, ready, read. Being confident of this, 
that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Let me call on the worship team to join me here now. Friends, if you have a pen or just your cell phone there, please write down these words. Remember these words or just take a picture right there. Happiness depends on happenings. But to rejoice is always a choice. Happiness depends on happenings. But to rejoice is always a choice. Brother, sister, what is your greatest source of joy? What are you really living for? Friends, if it's Jesus, be exalted and the gospel be extended, then there are no chains, there are no critics, there are no crises that can rob you of your joy. And then here's the last statement, and then we'll pray. Take a picture or write it down. Happiness is based on external condition that you need to control, but joy is based on an internal confidence that God is in control. That's the difference. That's what separates us Christians. When we go through tough times, we can be confident because we know that God is in control. God never commits mistakes. Now again, I do not know what you're going through these days. Maybe you're not feeling well. And you want to be prayed for? We'll just have one prayer for everyone. Let's all stand as we sing with the worship team. Maybe you have this longing in your heart. Lord, I would be happier if I have this thing. What is that thing? As I've said, nothing wrong with desiring this. But please don't make it a demand. As if God owes you. And that God is being unfair if you don't receive it. Maybe you're here this afternoon and there are just the chaotic relationships that you have now with your spouse or with your children. Maybe you're here this afternoon and there are some things that has to be chipped away from your life. Maybe the way you use your money. Maybe the way you use your time. Maybe the kind of people that you're associating with. And it's bringing you down instead of you taking them up. It's you being brought down to their level. Friends, I do not know what your situation is. But if you want to be blessed this afternoon, come to the front. This is between you and God. We will only have one prayer for everyone because it's your prayer that needs to be heard by God. Amen? Let's sing this song and then as the Spirit moves you, just come to the front and then we'll pray just one prayer for everyone.
God, brothers and sisters who are standing here in front, just raise your hands to the heavens. Come on, say your prayers to God. Confess what you need to confess. Ask God what you need to ask God. Whatever it is, this is the time when the Spirit will move your heart and God is here to cleanse you. God is here to comfort you. God is here to give you wisdom. Whatever it is, God is here. He is more than sufficient. Abundant provision is available for us this afternoon. Let's pray, oh Lord Jesus. Oh Lord Jesus, let us pray. Oh Father God, we pray. Oh Father God, let us pray. Oh Father God, your word Jesus Christ. Yes. Heavenly Father, you can hear each and every prayer right now. Lord, you know their needs. And we thank you that you are more than able, more than enough, more than powerful to provide for every need that is presented to you now. Lord, there are people who are asking for forgiveness. Lord, we pray that you'll chip away all these things that doesn't look like Jesus Christ. Maybe it's our addiction to Facebook or TikTok or pornography or whatever it is, Lord. We just pray right now. Cleanse us through the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Blot out all our transgressions. Oh, Father God, Lord, there are people who are here asking for healing in the relationships. Oh, Father God, Lord, heal this relationship between husband and wife, between parents and their children, between in-laws. Lord, the work, the workers in that office, Lord, we pray that you guide your children, that you grant them your hand of favor so that truth will come out. And Lord, we pray that you'll just give them that humility, that you'll give them that courage to be able to talk to people and the wisdom to say the right words so that indeed they can be reconciled. Father God, Lord, there are people here who are not feeling well. Lord, we just pray right now in Jesus' name. This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And Lord, we ask right now that anything that doesn't belong to you that doesn't belong in this body. Whatever sicknesses and defilements they may be, we ask them right now, be removed in Jesus' name. Lord, remove whatever it is that causing this pain in our bones, 
in our headaches, Lord, in our, in our hands, the arthritis, Lord. Lord, we pray that you will just cleanse our bodies from all these defilements. And we pray and dedicate this body as a service to you. We want to serve you the best way we can. And Father God, Lord, we thank you. Because we know that our lives are in your hands. If it's our time to go, it's our time to go. But Lord, as long as we have breath, we want to serve you the best way we can. And thank you, Heavenly Father, that this afternoon, as we dedicate our lives to you, with our hands cleansed, our minds cleansed, our eyes cleansed, our lives cleansed, use us, Lord, for your glory so that Christ may be shared to others through our testimony. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will use us for your glory. Thank you. And we ask this in Jesus' name and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just remain standing now as we have our benediction. Come on, just raise your hands to the heavens and receive this blessing from the Lord. The Lord will bless you and keep you. The Lord, the God of Israel, will not sleep nor slumber, but will be your constant guide and protection to help you win every battle, overcome whatever obstacle, and destroy every stronghold that hinders the advance of the work of God through you, in you, and for you. The Lord will make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord will lift up His countenance upon you and give you peace. He shall preserve you from all evil. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in. You are now blessed coming in and you are blessed going out. Go in the strength of God with the love of the Lord Jesus and the anointing power of the Holy Spirit and all God's people say, Amen and Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God.